Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to use the window of opportunity I have to simply throw out onto the table some views that seem very clear to me from an international perspective that have implications for Australia in general and for Western Australia specifically. One of them is the resurgence of inflation in the world economy. Now, this is a very controversial topic, <clears throat> and it depends where I am in the world what kind of reaction I get. If I'm in China or most emerging markets, everybody nods because they're definitely experiencing inflation. Some 40% of an emerging market worker's income is spent on food and energy. So if those prices go up, they feel it immediately. Um, if I'm in the United States, people kind of think that's a hypothetical maybe, someday we might have it. Uh, but my assessment of the world is that particularly the assets we take out of the ground, food, energy, and raw materials, are all experiencing, generally speaking, higher prices volatile prices, so I don't want to say it's a one-way story, and you are more familiar than most with the way prices have been moving in the hard asset category. But net-net, these prices are much higher than people would have expected given the state of the world economy. So this is really important because this is the critical driver for many of the events we see in the world economy. It partly explains why we have civil unrest across so many emerging markets from the Middle East now through to China, because people get upset when they lose their hope and faith in the future, which is a function of the global debt problem and the loss of GDP, the loss of hope, the loss of jobs, the loss of income, combined with any cr increase in the cost of living, creates a very painful squeeze. We see different societies responding to it in different ways. One of the interesting things is watching how China is responding to this. They are very afraid, in my judgment, of any kind of Middle East-like outcome, and so they're very focused on delivering food, energy, and raw materials to the population at the right price. Um, but within China, we see lots of signs of social unrest. And this puts immense pressure on the government to not stimulate the economy too much for fear of creating more inflation. Um, this is also interesting from an Australian perspective on two counts. Uh, number one is people around the world, investors, had assumed that Australia was a proxy for China. If you wanted to invest in China, you would just buy Australian assets, both iron ore and the currency. As it's turned out, as China has weakened, and I w let me be clear, my assessment is the Chinese economy is currently growing at zero, that their inflation rate in real life is close to 10 percent, and the growth rate is around seven, which means they're negative three. Um, that's a pretty bearish assessment, but I have to say that I think we're already at the hard landing in China, and I think the Chinese leadership think we're already at the hard landing. So the question is, do you think it'll get worse going forward? And my answer would be no. But it's only because they're working so very hard to contain these inflation pressures. Uh, so interestingly, Australia's currency has not weakened in spite of what has happened to China. And it has not weakened in spite of a fall in the price of iron ore and other hard assets. And I think that's partly because Australia is not a proxy for China, it's a proxy for inflation. And inv inflation conscious investors are going to buy Australian assets in their attempt to protect their assets from events that are increasing inflation risk. One of them, of course, is the way in which we have the largest number of industrialized economies ever, all printing money simultaneously, which inevitably pushes investors into hard, financial, hard assets and away from paper financial assets. Um, so in one respect, the world now looks at the Australian dollar the way they look at the Norwegian kroner. It doesn't reflect the view about that economy. It reflects a belief that there's a hard asset story that can protect you from governments printing money. Um, I also think it's very interesting when I'm here in Western Australia, there is such a focus in recent years on the relationship with China. The assumption that the economy is so intimately tied to the future of China. And yet, Western Australia and Australia in general are perfectly capable of producing lots of hard assets beyond mined assets. Uh, food springs to mind. And I have to say, one of the most popular investments around the world now 
for sovereign wealth funds, for pension funds, is to buy agricultural farmland in Australia. Um, and you are all well aware of the global demand for these assets and the constraints there are on foreigners buying them. But it's very interesting in a world where we have global food shortages that there is less discussion in this country about being the principal supplier for those kinds of assets. There's kind of a constant focus instead on, on iron ore and iron ore alone, which I find interesting. Um, and finally, I wanted to just touch on the issue of inflation creating some strategic security issues that Australia needs to think about. Um, from a Chinese perspective, <clears throat> they are very concerned about access to the supply lines of food, energy, and raw materials. And this is one reason we see China being more aggressive in the South China Sea, where they're effectively competing for control over energy assets that lie underneath most of these disputed island territories which have been in the press recently. I think it's very important that the U.S. has announced its so-called pivot strategy, moving our defense and strategic assets into the Pacific even as we draw them down in the Middle East. Um, and it's a kind of, you know, for he who must not be named, but everyone understands that the principal pur purpose of shifting our defense focus is because of a concern about China. Um, and as this contest between the U.S. and China for who's going to dominate space, cyberspace, the high seas, shipping lanes, these are all about securing supply lines and national security objectives. As this competition becomes more intense, which is driven by China's perception that the U.S. is going to inflate its way out of its debt, that that inflation will cause further social upheaval in China, then countries like Singapore and Australia are going to have to start thinking about how to manage this, given that, for example, Australia's economy is definitely connected to China's economy, and yet your defense policy is tied to the United States. And I'm not saying this can't be managed, I'm just saying it has to be managed. And it's going to become a more intense pressure as the economic forces that I've described intensify over time. Uh, one last point is all of this creates pressure on all the Asian economies who have tied their currencies to the U.S. dollar and U.S. monetary policy. And I've recently just come from Singapore, for example, where the official inflation rate is already 5%, but everybody knows it costs a lot more to live. So that's not the actual inflation number. And the higher that goes, which is bound to occur if you're tied to the U.S. dollar and the Americans are choosing inflation as a means of defaulting on the debt, then at some point the question of cutting the tie will become paramount. And I know the Singaporeans are already very disturbed about, well, if we cut it now, we'll create a problem in the property market and our bubble will burst. But they also know if they don't cut it, it will only be worse in two years' time. So the question for Australia of what are the implications of having all of the rest of Asia at some stage de-link from the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy is going to have enormous implications for asset prices and for the flow of capital. And so I'll finish with, with that thought in terms of capital markets and what it might mean for this country.